Hello, welcome from Fort Worth, Texas. I'm here at Wedgwood Baptist Church, where I've been for the last two years. You'll be glad I know not continuously. I do go home to my wife periodically. But ever since COVID hit, we've decided to bring this podcast to you. First, it was about our Sunday school class, but then it's various series or issues. And the Lord's blessed it. There are hundreds of you out there listening in, at least that's what the record seems to be. Now, you may just check in and check out. I don't know, but I'm so, faith, so glad for you. So thankful. We're finishing this series on repentance, what it means and what it looks like. And today I want to direct your attention to the Old Testament book of Haggai. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai. Chapter 1. And there's a phrase that's repeated twice there. It's called consider your ways. And it's the essence of what repentance means to the body corporate as well as the individual Christian. Let me pray and we'll get started. Father, your mercies are new every morning. You are faithful in all your ways. We're so grateful. We in counter-distinction, Lord, tend to wander. Our hearts grow cold. And so you call us back to yourself. You call us to stop and think about what we're doing and not just simply go through life responding to stimulus response. Teach this lesson through me, I pray today, that it might make a difference in my life and the life of everyone listening in. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The story goes of an old couple who were out driving on a Sunday afternoon back when we used to do those kinds of things. They were out in the country just driving along, talking, enjoying the beauty of nature. And all of a sudden they realized they were lost. Nothing looked familiar. So they stopped and asked a farmer. They said, where are we? And the farmer kind of grabbed his chin and said, well, where are you going? And the couple said, really nowhere in particular. And the farmer responded, he said, well, then it doesn't really matter, does it? If you don't know where you're going, wherever you are, it doesn't matter. Too many people, I'm afraid, are just wandering through life without a sense of purpose, without a sense of direction. No goals, no plans, just responding to circumstances like a bunch of Dodge cars at the carnival. Jean-Paul Sartre, the existential French philosopher, once said, Every man is born without a reason prolongs itself out of weakness, and dies by chance. How utterly depressing. Of course, existentialism, modern philosophy is overwhelmingly depressing. People never stop and think about life's purpose, their goals, their directions. I'm going to be mentoring a young pastor for the first time today, and we do it for the next six months. And one of the first things I ask seminary students, whoever I'm mentoring, eventually after the first session or two, I get them, write your own personal mission statement. In other words, what do you want your grandchildren and children to say about you at your funeral? What Stephen Covey says in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, begin with the end in mind. Where do you want to go? What do you, when all is said and done, your life is over, what do you want to have accomplished? What do you want your grandchildren to remember you for? Well, Grandpa had a corner office. Big, hairy deal. Stop and think. A man named Dr. Charles Garfield wrote a book entitled Peak Performance in which he studied athletes, businessmen, astronauts, educators, highly successful people, and what their key factors were. And the one single key factor he found is that they were all visualizers. They all knew what they wanted to do. They knew what they wanted to be, and they set out to do it. One of the best shooters in all of NBA history was a Boston Celtic guard by the name of Bill Sharma, especially when it came to free throws. And when asked the secret of his accuracy, he says, you've got to visualize the ball going through the hoop. Pretty interesting. I think of Michelangelo, the greatest, in my opinion, sculptor in all time. And Michelangelo would look at that rough-hewn block of granite or marble. And in his mind, he would visualize what he wanted the statue to look like as being enslaved and imprisoned in the matter, the granite, the marble around it. And his sculpting was a matter of freeing it and bringing it to life. Visualization. Atheist Richard Dawkins says this about life's purpose. 
He says the universe has precisely the properties we should expect if at bottom there is no design, no purpose, no good, no evil, nothing but blind, piteous indifference. Boy, it makes you want to spend a week, an evening with him, doesn't it? Each month, this is amazing, 250,000 Americans ask Google, what is the meaning of life? So far, there are 640 million recorded responses that pop up in a nanosecond and no consensus as to what it's all about, Alfie. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, by which our Reformed brethren instruct our child, their children in theology in a matter of question and answer like catechism is supposed to be. The first question is, little child, who made thee? And the answer they're made to memorize is, God made me. Second question, why did he make me? That's the second question for our forebears theologically. Well, let me give you the context for the book of Haggai, then we'll read from the first chapter and we'll share what the Lord's laid in my heart. It's around 500 years before Christ. The Babylonian captivity of Israel was over. The 70 years of judgment was up. And now the Persian king who's taken over from the Babylonians, a man named King Cyrus, pa passed a decree that all the Jews who wanted to could return to their homeland, return to Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, and rebuild the temple that was center to their culture and their religious faith. In fact, the Persian king even paid for them to do it, gave them the materials, the supplies, the goods. But out of about a million Jews... Only 42,000 bothered to return. The faithful remnant, if you will. 42,000 people went back with Nehemiah and Ezra to rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. As I said before, Cyrus also provided the materials, the money to rebuild it. But Cyrus died in battle. And opposition arose back in Judea, back in Jerusalem. Two characters by the name of Sanballat and Tobiah. Samaritans, who were the original cold water committee, who saw them rebuilding the temple, realized things were going to change. They'd been in power, and now there was a power shift. They started a letter-writing campaign back to Darius, the new Persian king, claiming that these Jews were planning insurrection and rebellion. These have always been a rebellious people, and you've got to stop them from building their walls, stop them from building their temple. And what happened is that the people of Israel became afraid, and they stopped the work. For 16 years, the temple remained a pile of rubble, while the Jews then turned to their own personal satisfaction and prosperity, while their soul wasted in toxic aridity. They lived in beautiful houses, three cars in every garage, a uh, 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 skyrocketing credit rating, but their soul was shriveling up. And to them and to us today, God says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Let me read the first 13 verses of Haggai chapter 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, who is the chief contractor, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, here's what God says. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be rebuilt. It's not good timing. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while God's temple lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, and here is the message today, consider your ways. Think about what you're doing. Then it describes their life, and if this isn't up to date, I don't know what is. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink and you're not filled with drink. You close yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put in a bag with holes. Does that sound like inflation to you? 
Thus says the Lord of hosts. Here it is again, repeated by the Holy Spirit of the living God. Consider your ways. Stop and think about what you're doing. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, circle this word, obeyed the voice of the Lord. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people secondly feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord your God. Well, consider your ways. Do you think maybe the Lord's talking to our generation? We get so busy about peripheral things and we forget the important things. And we insist on doing things our way and wonder why it comes to nothing. Do you remember the old invitation hymn? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after your will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Well, let's first look at perverted priorities. Let's look back at Israel and then we'll look at us. Sanballat and Tobiah were only lame excuses for neglecting spiritual things. And trying to stop the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of the walls that Cyrus had written down in the Law of the Medes and Persians. If you know anything about ancient history, you remember this, that the Law of the Medes and Persians cannot be broken. Cyrus or no Cyrus, king or no king, once it is encapsulated in the legal documents of the Persian Empire, it must be fulfilled. But Sanballat and Tobiah are stirring up trouble. So what? The real problem was that the Israelites had perverted priorities. They were looking out for number one first and letting God's work go to the devil. Me first. They were dwelling in better homes and gardens, paneled homes, while the temple lay in ruins. They were building their financial portfolio while re neglecting the things of the Spirit. In our churches today here in America, for years, churches were governed by the 80-20-20-80 rule. That 20% of the people do 80% of the work, give 80% of the funds. I am afraid that rule has changed, and it's now 10-90. 10% of the people do 90% of the work, give 90% of the offerings. The commitment level is at an all-time low. We seek after churches where we feel comfortable. If you feel comfortable in the house of the Lord, you can almost count on it. The presence of the Lord isn't there because no one feels comfortable in His presence. We seek out churches that meet my needs, that have programs with all the bells and whistles for our kids. And as soon as things don't go our way, we drop out and go church hopping when things don't go our way. Where is the commitment? Where is the commitment of our historical theological forefathers? I think of John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress in the 17th century. John Bunyan, dear people, spent 12 years in the city of Bedford's local prison. Every day he was given a, a tinder paper, just a sign. He was put there because he refused to sign 
either preach according to Anglican doctrine or be thrown in jail or refuse to preach. All he had to do was sign his name every day that he would not preach. He wasn't qualified according to the authorities. He refused to sign it. He spent 12 years of his life while his family nearly starved to death. He said, and I quote, the moss will grow on my eyelids before I renounce the call of Almighty God on my life. That's commitment. His wife and four children, including his favorite, Blind Mary, were forced to beg for food. It broke his heart. His wife was pregnant when he was arrested and the trauma of it caused her to miscarry and brought an unbearable ache in his heart. Blind Mary died without her daddy. All he had to do was sign the paper and go free. The moss shall grow on my eyelids before I surrender my principles. Where is that kind of commitment? The one problem that the people of Israel had was they neglected the rebuilding of the temple. Now we need to stop here and ask ourselves, what was the significance of the temple to God's people throughout biblical times, Old Testament and New. As you study the Bible, you'll find there are only two places in the whole Bible where there is no temple. The first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of Revelation. Why did the temple come about? Because the temple was the place where sin was dealt with and fellowship was restored. I need to say that again. The temple was the place where sin was dealt with and fellowship is restored. There was no sin in the garden before the third chapter of, uh, of Genesis, so they didn't need a temple. But once they sinned, sacrifice had to be made, i.e. a temple. And an animal had to die so their nakedness could be covered, but more importantly, so that blood could be shed on their behalf as their substitute so they wouldn't have to die physically. The last two chapters of Revelation, there is no sin. There's a new heaven and a new earth. We have new bodies, new spirits, new souls that are sinless forever. But in between those chapters, sin is the overarching, ever-present problem, the fly in the ointment that must be dealt with before we can be restored to fellowship with our Creator and our Redeemer. Before Moses... There were various altars. Abraham, excuse me, had an altar. Isaac and Jacob. The, the, the place where sin is dealt with. After Jesus, when Titus destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, where is the temple? Paul tells us, don't you know your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you and who dwells with you? And that's where sin must be dealt with. In reestablishing our relationship with God. In between, sin is the dominant factor and broken fellowship with God. The point I'm trying to make is this. The primary purpose for which God made us. Boy, listen up. The primary purpose for which God made us is to fellowship with Him. The answer to the Trinity's question in Genesis 1. Let's make man in our own image. And so they did and had a relationship where they walked with the second person of the Trinity face to face in the cool of the day, but it was shattered by the breaking of sin. And so God is out to teach us how to reestablish that fellowship with God, a living, loving, longing relationship, God, and what he is what he desires most. Kay and I last week celebrated our 56th anniversary. Married for six, 56 years. We dated and courted each other for four and a half years before that. Literally, we raised each other. 60 years we've been together. And I've learned I can take out the garbage. I can mow the yard. I can change the oil. I can make the bed. All of these are fine and good and they have their place. But I want to tell you this. If my eyes don't line up, when I look into a crowded room and I finally spot my bride, if my eyes don't light up and blink with passion and devotion, her heart will be broken. There'll be a stone there that no act of service can replace. 
The Ephesian church had correct doctrine. They were busy. They were doing all the things a church should do. And God said, yet I have one thing against you. You have left your first love. And you can be doing all the right things and not be fellowshipping with the living God. God says, consider your ways. Like a brokenhearted lover, come back to me. Do you remember this old praise chorus from the 90s? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. What are the consequences of these perverted priorities? And there are consequences. God just doesn't let us go on and neglect Him and neglect fellowship. Well, there are several of them. Let me read verse 6 first of all. You find that futility is one of the results. You have sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you're not filled. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put in a bag with holes. Where is it all God? All their efforts brought no lasting results. All their eating brought no satisfaction. All their clothing brought no warmth. And all their wages, it's gone. We live in a world in which children sing, maybe you remember this advertisement. Oh, I wish I were an Oscar Mayer wiener. That is what I'd really like to be. Because if I were an Oscar Mayer wiener, everyone would be in love with me. Oh, really? Really? What kind of a world is it where we pay millions of dollars for children to sing about wanting to become a hot dog? So they might be loved as one loves a hot dog, to millions of willing listeners. Is it any wonder that depression is pandemic in our generation? How is it that the wisdom of the ages is scintillated in bumper stickers that say, blank happens? Reject all authority. Commit a random act of kindness. Or how about this one? He who dies with the most ties, toys wins. I don't care if you die with the most toys. In the end, you still die. How utter futile our lives have become. Look at verse 9 and the disappointment. Let me read it. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away, says God. Why? Because of my house that is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own well-furnished house. Disappointment. High expectations, low results. Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. I share my people. Know, anybody who knows me know I love chocolate chip cookies. I hope there's one on the counter when I leave here on my way out. Every once in a while, I had an administrator, Mike Holton, who would slip into a basket of chocolate chip cookies, oatmeal raisins. Oatmeal raisins look like chocolate chip cookies. And if I don't look carefully, I'll bring one out and expecting chocolate chip cookie bite into oatmeal and raisin. Talk about hope deferred making the heart sick. That's what this is about. Worldly success without the presence of Christ turns to ashes in your mouth. Would you train all the trade, all the worldly success you can get and forfeit the presence and person of Christ in your life? No way. Do you remember in Exodus 33 where Moses came down the first time from Mount Sinai with the tablets and Israel gone whoring after other gods, made a golden calf, bowed down to it and said, this is what saved us from Egypt. And a plague came. 5,000 people died like that. And finally got things settled. Moses went back up the mountain and God told Moses, said, look, Moses, I'll tell you what, get out of the way. I'm going to kill all these people. They're so stiff-necked and rebellious. I'll give you success. My angel will go before you. I'll give you a whole other nation. All your enemies will cower and defeat before you. 
but my presence will no longer go before you. I'm afraid I'll smack them all down in a fit of anger. In other words, I'll give you all the success you want, but not my presence. And Moses says, not another step without your presence. Success, I'd rather die in the wilderness, and he did, than succeed in the land of promise without you, dear Lord. That's what they were living with. That's what John Newton meant when he wrote the words, how tedious and tasteless the hours when Jesus no longer I see. Life becomes a drudgery when you can't sense the presence of God. And that's what these people were doing. That's what's happening to us. Futility, disappointment, and drought. Verse 11, God says, For I called a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on the old men, the livestock. Drought is always a sign of God's displeasure. Life becomes an arid wasteland and everything is dry and fruitless. We work like slaves to provide for our families and our children grow up to become ungrateful rebels. We sweat and slave to get ahead and only find ourselves in another tax bracket where the money we thought we were gaining goes back to the government. Inflation takes over. God makes, puts it in a bag with holes in it. That's what happens. Futility, disappointment, and drought. So what then is the pathway to peace? What is the solution? Verses 12 and 13. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, here's the first step, obeyed the voice of the Lord. Obey. The people repented. The people confessed their sins to God transparently and turned 180 degrees and got back to rebuilding the temple, back to restoring fellowship with the one true God. Obedience. Did you know, are you familiar with the five languages of love? You know, acts of service, gifts, time together, uh, uh, words of affirmation, and affectionate touch. Do you know what God's love language is? Obedience. If you love me, keep my commandments. Make worship priority number one. Keep the fellowship with Christ fresh and new. They obeyed. Secondly, it says they feared the Lord their God. A right relationship with God starts with a holy fear of who he is. Please know this, God will never be the big man upstairs. He is El Shaddai, the Ancient of Days, the Holy One of Israel. And we bow in awe in His presence. And finally, fellowship, verse 13. For I am with you, says the Lord your God. All astounding me, Almighty God longs to be in sweet communion and fellowship with the likes of me. And when this old world dissolves in a fiery blaze, for it burns with fervent heat, and God makes a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation 21, John says, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And God says, Behold, I will be your God and I will be with you forever. Nothing ever compares to the presence of God. Fellowship with your Creator, with your Redeemer. And anything that would threaten that relationship must go. When our family was very young, I was pastoring a church in Georgia. Becky was, I can remember, about four and a half. Josh was about two. It was the end of a long day, and I decided the family, after supper, would go for a walk through the neighborhood down Lake Forest Drive. And Josh was in a wagon, and Becky was dawdling trying to find the right tennis shoes. I don't know. Come on, Becky. Let's go. Come on, Becky. we got to go. Come on. And finally, I got a little upset with her. With a harsh voice, I said, Becky, you either come on or we're going to leave you behind. And slammed the door and went with Josh and Kay down the sidewalk. 
And there behind, about ten yards, was Becky, sniffling. I wasn't going to turn back. Should have probably. Sniffling as she stumbled along with her tennis shoes untied, trying to keep up. And finally, all of a sudden, I felt this soft, wet hand reach up for mine. It was like my daughter was saying by her actions, I don't want to go anywhere without you, Daddy. Do you think that's what our Savior and our God feels when our fellowship is broken? He's waiting for us to return and to reach up our hands in His. I don't want to go anywhere without you, Jesus. Stop. Consider your ways. Oh Lord, give us the grace to do just that. To consider our ways, to think about what we're doing and be urgent and diligent to reestablish fellowship with you. Show us what we need to obey you about. Teach us a holy fear of you. And Father, may we restore that sweet fellowship that once we knew. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless.